Episode 3 of Dungeon Meshi is by far the best one yet, so as always, let's break it down and compare it a little bit to the manga along the way. Last time I said it definitely feels like they're trying to save money right now. We can only hope it's for a good reason. It definitely was. Erm, um, faith in humanity equals restored. Certified Reddit moment. There are so many great moments in this episode. I'm spoiled for choice, but I'll do my best. This episode was directed by Kodai Nakano and storyboarded by Ichigo Kano. This first scene is all about projected light and cast shadows. I love the way that as Laios lowers the lantern, Chilchuk's shadow stretches upwards on the wall behind him. I guess technically this starting point doesn't make logical sense because the shadow is being projected upward even though the lantern is above Chilchuk's head, but key animator Chiemi Kurosaki takes some artistic license to create a more interesting composition with something that still feels realistic even if it technically isn't. They've really taken some liberties with the character designs to show how startled they are in this reaction shot as Chilchuk opens the secret passage, and I love how Senshi is cowering behind Chilchuk, emphasizing the trust that was built up between the two of them at the end of the last episode. This shot isn't in the manga by the way, so it's a great way to add some extra excitement to the very start of the episode. Continuing with the theme of less is more from the previous two episodes, this shot during the Living Armor flashback is super startling because there's no anticipation to this movement. If you want to learn more about anticipation in animation, I talked about it more in this video, which I'll link in the top right corner. But normally a character would reel back a bit before the stabbing motion to build up momentum, but here it's just one swift robotic motion. The armor does quickly bring the sword down before stabbing this guy, but this is only to get a low enough angle for this motion to even be possible. Just like these two simple panels from the manga, the lack of anticipation here makes this motion feel stiff and inhuman. When we cut outward to this wider shot, we don't even get to see the moment of impact because, just like the characters in the scene, we don't even know what's happening until it's too late. Compare that to this incredibly cool shot, which starts as a close-up before seamlessly reframing to a medium shot as Laios dodges this sword swing. Laios winds up his swing for 8 frames and almost a full 2 seconds before bringing it sharply down. Down. Not only does this difference make the living armor feel cold-blooded and intimidating, it also communicates the stakes of this battle, and thus the entire episode. Laios and the humans in general are at a huge disadvantage because his sword swings literally take twice as long, and this is only compounded by his sword shattering the moment it comes in contact with the other blade. And one more cool little detail, this time one that's also present in the manga. After the sword breaks, they break the 180 degree rule. The 180 degree rule is a basic rule of thumb mostly used in live action production. If you were to draw an imaginary line between the two main players in a certain scene, you generally would want to keep the camera on one side of that line, so as to keep the geography of the scene consistent and understandable. If you cut from one side of that line to the other, it can be shocking and disorienting, but the greatest filmmakers use this to their advantage and break the rule on purpose. Starting from this shot, the simulated camera always stays on Laios' right side, so he's on the left side of the frame, looking right. But after his sword breaks and it becomes clear that fighting back is completely futile, and as Laios backs up, he's now facing to the left of the screen, illustrating how the scene has been completely recontextualized. After cutting back to modern day when Laios is more experienced and more prepared, the living armor moves a bit differently now, giving off more of a zombie vibe than the robot one that it was before. The suit lurches forward quickly on one foot, and its arms follow loosely behind and swing into place. This vibe shift could indicate that maybe the armor hasn't moved in a long Long time, and also that, let's be real here, this cut was likely done by a different key animator. But the biggest thing that it signifies to me is a difference in perspective from Laios. Three years ago, the living armor was an unknowable and insurmountable threat, so it moved like a terminator. But now, Laios is armed with more experience, a party that's got his back, and most importantly, curiosity. So now, while certainly still intimidating, the living armor is a puzzle to be solved. This shot foreshadows a moment from near the end of the story, if you've read the books, hopefully you know what I'm talking about. And I love the added drama from the plume fluttering into place in slow motion. This shot is so simple, but it's one of my favorites in the episode. It's presumably key animated by Yoshitaka Mano because that's who did the cut immediately following it. This is another shot that's original to the anime, and Studio Trigger brings so much personality to Laios with these run cycles, just like that one from the start of episode 1. His gait is slower than everyone else's because he's the biggest of the group and weighed down by heavy plate mail 
but he's also not running with any urgency. His head is pinned straight back with a look of curiosity, making his stride lopsided and unbalanced, and I love the way that his right arm swings so far back to balance his body out. I can just imagine the reference footage that somebody probably filmed for this shot. Then there's some absurdly triggery animation here, where they depict some really crazy frantic movements with relatively few frames. Marcel snaps from pose to pose with some ridiculously exaggerated smear frames and doubling. Here are a few of my favorite smear frames from this cut. This is then contrasted with this slow, smooth motion in the helmets. And some of this is actually animated on ones, which just further underscores the contrast between these two shots. Here's a frame that I didn't notice until I went through this frame by frame. In her shock, Marcel baps herself in the face with her staff, and Gua is straight up just written on her mouth along with Besh on the impact. This is only on screen for one twelfth of a second, so it almost feels like an inside joke that we weren't even supposed to notice. This big smash from Senshi looks so crunchy because of this double impact effect, which is super common in anime. The axe makes contact, but the armor delays, moving slowly for 11 frames before finally getting blasted out of frame. This is kind of like the speed ramping effect they'd use in movies like 300, but it also gives the sense that this swing is so powerful that even with initial resistance, it still pushes through with this sort of innate force. There's some great follow through in this shot of Marcel, and with so much comic relief fail wife Marcel, it's nice to finally see how powerful she really is. Here's another example of that double impact thing when this colony kicks Laius, and the way its whole upper body gets carelessly flung backward with this kick shows both how powerful the kick is and the fact that this thing may be shaped like a human, but it certainly doesn't move like one. This is such an incredible interpretation of these two panels from the manga. Kai Ikarashi does an amazing job portraying this rose-tinted memory and the childlike wonder that Laios must have felt in this moment. The backgrounds are drawn as animation cells, allowing the camera to swing around wildly like this, and everything is so loose and abstract with these crazy pink and yellow color choices. Ah, there's just so much to talk about in this cut. But the point is, I really feel like I'm inside a fuzzy but joyous and defining childhood memory. And this galaxy brain epiphany moment is so perfect as the culmination to this sequence. This may be a weird comment, but I love the focus on the construction of his nose here. It's really the defining part of Laios' face, and it's a nice change of pace when there's so much nose erasure in anime. As someone with a big nose, I feel seen. This sequence is the exact opposite of that shot I complained about in the last episode. They've taken such a simple moment and elevated it unbelievably to give the audience the feeling of wonder and excitement that Laios feels to solve this puzzle and learn something new. And afterward, look how the color palette of the scene has changed completely. Laios now has the upper hand and is excited to take on this challenge, and that's reflected in the colors. I do miss this little detail where Laios stores the egg sack in his dresser. It is the human child experience to want to collect things, but with the direction they took the scene, it would have interrupted the momentum a bit too much. And the treats just keep on coming because now it's time for the first of what I assume will be many senshi panty shots. Throughout this next sequence, there's so much incredible animation here with so much great trigger flair, I really can't talk about it all. And I'm saying that as much to myself as I am to you. So lightning round. More hilarious smear frames and doubling. This swirly point of view shot is such an amazing use of what I think is just five frames of animation. They do tons of great framing stuff with Marcel's staff. This shot again shows how the mollusks don't really know how to move a human body properly and makes the mini boss armor feel so much more manageable now that Laios knows how it functions. This shot where Marcel hooks Laios' head with her staff and jerks it around like a bobblehead while the rest of his body stays completely still is delightful. Let me know what your favorite moments from this episode were in the comments because there was just so much incredible stuff in this episode that I didn't have time to get to. I really loved this episode and I'm so glad because I remember this being the moment when it really clicked for me in the manga too. This is the first time they've come up against something that no one in the party already knows about. So Laios's downright obsession with learning everything he can about monsters is the crucial tool needed to defeat them. This whole episode is so impressionistic, showing things through Laios's eyes, from the way the living armor moves to the color palette. I couldn't help but feel excited for him when he figured out the secret to the living armor, even though I already knew what was going to happen. There are times when the characters look a little off model, but it always feels intentional, like the shape of a character's face is a direct representation of how they're feeling in that moment. We're in a time dominated by the MAPPA style of high fidelity, highly realistic, and consistent design 
designs, movements, textures, and 3D backgrounds. And don't get me wrong, shows like Jujutsu Kaisen are great in their own way too, but it's refreshing to see something that's unafraid to be unabashedly different, stylized, and at times unrealistic, because animation is, by its nature, a medium where literally anything is possible. Okay, I have to stop writing, otherwise I won't be able to get this video out before the next episode, but hot dog, this episode blew me away. I can't wait to see where we go next.